Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Colby Morgan. I'm here with Jeffrey Hoffman. We're both offensive security engineers at Robinhood. And earlier this year, we did some research into 1Password for Mac uh, with the goal of identifying local attacks to dump vaults. And today, we're going to be sharing with you the outcome of our research and some of the uh, vulnerabilities we discovered. So why look at 1Password for Mac? Um, well, if you use 1Password, it's probably a place where you have some of your most sensitive credentials. And we know that APTs, the red teamers, one of the first things they're going to do when they land on an endpoint is look for credentials. Things like uh, cloud credentials, browser cookies, um, passwords, API keys, things they might be able to use even if they were evicted from the laptop uh, to retain um, some sort of access or even more access. Um, if they were to be grepping around uh, looking for files that have the word password in the file name, one thing they would find is this one password.sqlite file. And this is a SQLite database. Uh, it's encrypted, but it contains your uh, 1Password vault contents. So that file itself wouldn't get you much. Um, so we're going to talk about some attacks later that might be able to get you some of that content. Um, so to talk a little bit about the local security model of 1Password on Mac, um, when you log in with your password to 1Password, uh, it doesn't actually store your password. It's not even sending your password to the server. Instead, what's going on is um, your password along with a locally stored secret key are combined cryptographically to generate a master unlock key uh, which is now referred to as an account unlock key. You'll hear us throughout this talk refer to it as a muck because that's how we saw it referenced in the code. Um, so we use SSO meaning uh, we don't have a password for one password and how it works in this case is uh, you authenticate and then you get a device key um, and you receive a credential bundle from 1Password's API and the device key is stored in your Mac keychain and that is used to decrypt the credential bundle that contains that muck that I referenced. So the muck is basically the keys to the kingdom. It allows you to decrypt that SQLite database where your vault content is stored. Malware on your machine uh, without a SIP bypass on Mac or, or a way to inject into processes arbitrarily shouldn't be able to get your vault contents uh, decrypted um, without, in the SSO case, unrestricted keychain access, and in the non SSO case, um, access to your 1Password password, password, meaning something you know, um, and your locally stored secret key. Once you have the muck, uh, the full decryption process um, isn't super straightforward, but it's fully explained in this blog post from David Schutz, aka Darthnal, uh, where he also had some code that we referenced for the, the decryption, and so this was really helpful in our research. Yeah, so it's generally understood that if somebody has full control over your machine, they're going to be able to access whatever data it protects in some way, shape, or form. That being said, 1Password still cares about creating meaningful security boundaries wherever possible. And on macOS specifically, with things like SIP and code signing, uh, it, there is a possibility to create these significant boundaries. Uh, these are just some CVEs that are Mac specific. Uh, we took a look at these CVEs when we first started our work and they indicated to us that we were thinking about the right things and looking in the right places. So when we started out looking at 1Password, we didn't really look at the app. We looked at the framework that it was built on. Uh, we looked at the framework that it was built on, uh, which is Electron. And so Electron is a Chromium and node based framework. It has a pretty well defined attack surface. The standard attack you'll see is somebody trying to get XSS and convert that into RCE or, or something else. But 1Password is an app, doesn't have a whole lot of opportunities to inject user controlled content. Uh, the XSS to RCE route is usually considered a, a remote attack, but because we're local attackers, we have the ability to consider local things. And one of the local security controls in Electron is something called fuses. Uh, these fuses control the behavior of 1Password in certain situations. I'm not going to read all of these off to you, but I'll tell you that 1Password correctly set all of these. Uh, but some of the interesting ones that, that you might take a look at are things like only load out from ASAR. Uh, if this had been enabled or rather disabled, uh, you might be able to proxy the app and inject JavaScript that way. And the enable node CLI inspect arguments fuse is also pretty interesting. It controls whether or not this Chromium flag called the remote debugging port works. If that had been enabled in 1Password, we would have uh, started it with this flag, uh, connected a Chromium debugger to it, and from there you can see all the pages that the app has. You would have been able to inject uh, JavaScript or change the currently running JavaScript in any of those pages. So once we saw that all the electron uh, 
attack surface was, was considered and was it going to be viable. We started looking at how the app functioned and there were three main ways that we saw to get passwords out of the desktop app and those were the SSH agent, the CLI and the browser extension. Now the SSH agent and the CLI were disabled by default but the browser extension is enabled by default. And so once we saw this we installed the browser extension and as long as the app is unlocked if you click the browser extension it's going to seamlessly sync all of your passwords and they're going to show up without any kind of reauthentication. And so as soon as we saw that behavior we started trying to figure out how we could abuse that. And so we briefly considered the idea of maybe if we had some cool RCE and sandbox escape we could control Chrome and try to do that remotely. Those are prohibitively expensive and again because we're local attackers we have much less expensive options. And uh, that fuse that I mentioned before that controlled the remote debugging port, that's a chromium flag. And so while Electron can turn that off, Chrome and other chromium based browsers can't. It's just how they work. Uh, so as soon as we realized that, we found the JavaScript responsible for doing the syncing. It's that green URL that's on screen now. And we opened it up, looked at the console, and we saw some log messages related to native core. This is a native messaging host, and we'll, re we'll revisit that in a little bit. Uh, but essentially what we did is we read the JavaScript from that page, uh, beautified it, modified it to do that syncing behavior immediately and with the remote debugging port we just injected our new extension into that page and uh, everything was synced and we were able to e extract passwords and decrypt them. And so this is our mental model of 1Password. We'll revisit this image a couple of times during the presentation uh, but what's important to note here is that we didn't really have a vulnerability in one password exactly. We're kind of just abusing how Chrome and extensions function. Yeah, so sticking along the path of attacking the browser extension, um, one question we were asking ourselves is would we be able to spoof the legitimate one password extension with our own extension or make changes to the one password extension and still, uh, still have it do that automatic syncing process Jeff uh, referred to before? Um, so, if you're not familiar, uh, you can start Chrome from the command line uh, along with this dash dash load extension flag to load extensions from disk, um, which are referred to as unpacked extensions. So what we were wondering is if we could load a modified version of 1Password from disk uh, and have it do that syncing process. Obviously the modified code we would add would be JavaScript that makes it do what we want, such as like taking those passwords after they sync and sending them to a remote server. Um, and there were a couple of kind of challenges that uh, made this not straightforward. So First, uh, the, when the extension talks to the Mac OS 1Password app, uh, the 1Password app is going to verify that the connection is coming from the legitimate extension's extension identifier. Um, and then further, we have a managed Chrome policy that prevents uh, loading unpacked extensions altogether, meaning we couldn't launch Chrome with that CLI flag. Um, and also, all extensions are disallowed by default, with only some being allow listed. So we started trying to tackle these challenges one by one. Uh, first, uh, spoofing the extension identifier. Thankfully, this was extremely straightforward because Google tells us exactly how to do it on their browser extension uh, security FAQ page, where they basically explain that they don't consider this a bug. And um, basically, um, every browser extension has a manifest.json file with a bunch of key entries. Um, one of those is called key, and um, basically, if you take that key entry and put it in your own extensions manifest.json file, the extension IDs will be the same because the extension identifier is derived from that key entry. So we can just grab the legitimate extensions um, key identifier, put that in our own extension, and then it'll match. So now we're left with the challenges from the managed Chrome policy. Uh, we basically started just trying to figure out how it worked and how it is enforced and we came across this policy directory in Google Chrome's um, application support directory. And we decided to just remove it and see what happens. Um, so if you delete that policy directory and you start Chrome, Chrome is actually smart enough to realize it should be there and it'll recreate it and it'll start reinforcing itself. However, um, as I mentioned before, we were prevented from starting Chrome with the dash dash load extension flag. But what you can do is delete the policy directory, start Chrome with the dash dash load extension flag, which will load your extension. Um, and it, that works because the policy directory doesn't exist at the time Chrome starts. But then Chrome will recreate that directory and start reinforcing itself. Um, but your extension is already loaded. Um, but Chrome will start going through and saying which extension should be allowed. If it's not allowed, remove it. 
Um, but thankfully, it's only doing a shallow check of comparing the extension identifier to the allow list, and we're spoofing the legitimate extension's extension identifier, so it doesn't remove our modified one password. Um, so that overcomes all of the challenges we had, and here is us just uh, adding a poc.html file to the extension. We have the legitimate extension identifier, so our passwords do sync when one password is unlocked, um, and it pulls in all our passwords as expected. And obviously, we could have also added, um, edited the JavaScript or added JavaScript to uh, make it grab those credentials and send them elsewhere. So earlier I brought up the term native messaging host, and what that is is a binary that acts as a middleman between uh, Chrome or other browsers that support this protocol and the desktop app. And uh, how it normally works is Chrome will launch it, it will uh, hold pipes to the standard in and standard out of that process, and then send JSON messages back and forth. And if you're familiar with IPC on macOS specifically, that's a big deviation from the norm. Normally things use XPC, and part of the reason they do that is because when you use XPC, you have something called an audit token available to you, and you can use that audit token to securely look up the code signing information of the process sending the message. Because there's no audit token, and there's no way to attach it to this method of IPC, uh, there's not really a great way for 1Password to go and verify the code signing information of whatever is sending that JSON. And they seem to know about this and, and still try to implement uh, a parent PID check, and essentially what they did was they would call get PPID, go look up the code signing information of the parent, and check it a bunch of, uh, check it across the list of accepted and trusted browsers. But that's a generally understood, you know, anti-pattern on XPC. The reason they tried it here is again, there's no audit token, so they can't really do much better. Uh, so, going forward, we're going to talk about dumping and instrumenting and hooking, and our tool of choice for that was Frida. We're going to release some Frida scripts for people to look at other native messaging hosts. Um, what you can see on screen here is me hooking the read and write methods for the native messaging host, and this is how we figured out what JSON to send when we actually wrote our exploit. And so like I said, it's a well understood problem that if you're doing XPC, you should be using the audit token because if you try to look up the code signing information by PID, what can happen is someone will send a message, exec into the actual process that was supposed to send that message, and by the time the PID is used, the code signing information will be that of the trusted process and not the malicious one that sent that initial message. And so we considered doing that, but we actually don't have to. There's a, a much better way. What you can do is create this process tree of three processes where the parent holds the standard in and standard out write pipes, the child execs into a trusted browser, and the grandchild is actually the browser support process. And when it goes to do that uh, get PPID check, we've satisfied that condition. So this is what the exploit looks like in process, and once you've set up these pipes, you can just send the JSON that we showed uh, in the Frida slide, and the browser support process will happily return back to you the muck. And so here's our mental model again. We've totally cut Chrome and the need for the actual extension out of the equation. This time we're attacking browser support. And we were satisfied with this. This is definitely a valid way to uh, get the muck and, and dump all your vaults. But we thought, well, what if we could also cut out browser support? So we started looking at the browser helper XPC server. And I've talked a, a lot about XPC already. I'll, I'll spare you. But they do everything correctly here that you would expect. They take the audit token. They get the code signing information in a secure way. And they check the team identifier and bundle ID. Unfortunately, what they forgot to do was consider uh, the hardened runtime or the code signing flags of the client. And so if you're not familiar with hardened runtime, essentially what it is is a code signing flag that says to Mac OS uh, to uh, block all different manners of injecting uh, code dynamically. And that makes sense, right? If your security model is going to be built around code signing, you don't want ways to have untrusted code running in a process without invalidating that signature. And so that was introduced in September of 2018, and it would have been literally impossible for them to include that control, and they were a company before 2018. And so we thought maybe if we could find some old clients, we could do this injection and satisfy their checks. Um, 
Yeah, so like Jeff mentioned, what they were doing is checking the code signature information of the XPC client to see if it had a matching team identifier. They weren't checking for the hardened runtime, so we knew what we needed to find, an old version of 1Password that matched these conditions. Uh, we couldn't find any official source from 1Password that was offering old versions of clients, so we tried to get a little bit creative, and what we did is tried to enumerate subdomains of 1Password.com by looking at certificate transparency logs, and one of the subdomains we found was c.1password.com, and it appeared to be some sort of web cache. We didn't really know what it was used for. Um, so we used Google Dorks to see what files Google had indexed um, on the URL, and we found a bunch of old versions of 1Password for all different operating systems. Um, one of the oldest ones we could find for Mac was version 6.5.2. So we pulled that down, and it looked like a perfect candidate because it had the correct team identifier, even though it was very old, um, and it didn't have the hardened runtime. So we figured we likely could inject into it. If you have a binary that is not signed with the hardened runtime, um, the easiest way to inject into it is to write your own dynamic library uh, that runs whatever code you want in its constructor. And then you load that dynamic library uh, as you launch the program using the dial D insert libraries environment variable. This is very similar to LD preload on Linux uh, for loading shared objects. Um, basically, you can, it'll be the first dynamic library that the program loads, and it'll run your code pretty much immediately. So we knew that the XPC server exposed one method called echo, which just echoed a string back to you. So as a proof of concept, we just wrote our dynamic library to send the string hello world to the server. Um, as you can see here, uh, once our code runs, it does send that string, we get a successful response, and this is great because it proves that um, the XPC server validation was passed by our client. So obviously we didn't want to just echo strings back to ourselves, um, so we looked at what other methods were available, and the one that performed actually interesting functionality was called send to main, uh, where basically a message gets sent through browser helper and then to the main application um, and gives you a response. Um, so what we tried doing was just sending the same messages that the browser extension was triggering, um, but unfortunately we were just getting no responses whatsoever when we would do that. It would just totally hang. Um, so through some debugging, we found that when our connection was created, there was a connection object and there was a Boolean flag on it of is browser equals false, and we figured this might be problematic. Um, and it seemed to be getting set to false because our client's package ID, 1Password6 in this case, uh, didn't match what was expected being the browser support process. Um, so we didn't give up there because we knew that the 1Password CLI tool um, called OP, uh, we knew that that also communicated with the same XPC server using XPC messages, so we wanted to understand how that worked. To do so, we pulled down this XPC spy uh, open source program for inspecting XPC traffic that a process is sending, and we started using uh, the OP tool uh, while looking at the XPC traffic. And we saw that it was sending uh, similar XPC traffic, but um, it was including this client info JSON blob. Um, and I'll explain kind of the significance of some of the values you see uh, highlighted in red here in the coming slides. But um, the point is, we were able to send messages in the same way the 1Password CLI was and mimic the functionality of the 1Password CLI. And this was nice. Um, but there's quite a few limitations that we weren't satisfied with. First, CLI integration is disabled by default. So uh, if you're sending these messages and the CLI integration is disabled, nothing's going to happen. Um, and, you know, most people probably haven't turned it on. So we were wondering, could we just find where the settings are stored and enable it ourselves? And we found this settings.json file. Um, we opened it, we saw a bunch of Boolean flags for various settings, one of them being CLI integration. Um, but we also saw that every setting had a corresponding auth tag, which looked like a big random string that we assumed was protecting the integrity of the settings through some authenticated hash or something like that. So we assumed this wasn't going to work, but we tried it anyway, Swipped, switched to CLI integration from false to true, and it just worked. So it seemed like these auth tags were here, probably secure, but they just weren't being enforced yet. So we can enable CLI integration, great. Uh, but there's still uh, some serious limitations here. Um, the first being that when you use the 1Password CLI, you have to approve the session. So if you've used it before, you're probably familiar with this image on the left, where it's going to say your terminal is requesting access to 1Password, do you want to authorize it or not? Um, and so what we saw was that your session basically gets created based on the XPC messages that get sent when you run the uh, OP tool, 
And the session identifier is basically based on the PID of your shell being the parent process that calls the tool and the start time of that parent process. And so it'd be pretty easy for malware on the machine to basically look for any shell that spawns the OPCLI, figure out the PID of that shell, and then grab the start time of the process, and then you know a valid session identifier and you could ride along with it, sending whatever messages you want with an approved session. However, um, this, you know, obviously isn't optimal either because it requires that there's a legitimate user sitting there really using the 1Password CLI having an active session that you could spoof alongside. So we kept digging here. Um, we uh, saw that in the client info JSON blob there was a session type of CLI being sent when the CLI was being used. And uh, we were wondering if any other session types might be supported. We disassembled the browser helper binary to take a look. And we saw that it seemed like the string of browser could also be a valid session type. And this was interesting to us because we hadn't seen this string being sent by uh, the extension. But uh, we tried it anyway to see what would happen. We removed all of those other session identifiers that I was mentioning before, and it just totally worked. If one password was unlocked, we were able to send a session type browser, request the muck, and we were able to grab it. So that kind of completed the chain of um, injecting into an old client, sending XPC messages, and grabbing the muck. Um, so you may have noticed that every issue we've discussed so far requires that one password is unlocked. Um, this next and final issue we're going to discuss does not require that one password is unlocked. And it focuses on how biometric authentication is implemented. If you uh, use one password on a MacBook, you're probably familiar with this. You launch one password, you provide your fingerprint, it unlocks. Um, so a very common way that macOS apps are going to implement fingerprint checks is by using this evaluate policy method. And it's pretty simple. You call it, prompts the user for their fingerprint. If they provide it and it's valid, it returns true. Otherwise, it returns false. So what we did to make sure this method was in use, we hooked it with Frida, uh, used the code on the right uh, screenshot here, and just basically made it always return true no matter what. And so after doing that, we launched one password, prompted for our fingerprint. We could either hit cancel or provide someone else's fingerprint, and the vault unlocks. So um, you might be thinking, well, you know, if you're a red teamer, you land on someone's laptop, you can't just disable SIP and hook methods with Frida. And that's true. But this taught us something really interesting, which is that even with an invalid fingerprint, somehow 1Password is grabbing the muck and it is decrypting the vaults and displaying your passwords. So we wanted to understand how that worked. Um, and also, it's not obvious that this was going to work just hooking um, methods with Frida, because it is possible to protect items at the keychain level with flags that indicate a fingerprint is required. And you wouldn't be able to just hook something with Frida and make that work, because the keychain would protect you with your fingerprint. So that was not what was going on here. So how does it work? We figured the keychain was involved in some way, so we opened the keychain access application and started looking around, and we saw that when using biometric authentication, there were uh, these items, or there was a item in the keychain called biometric unlock, and it would be named differently depending on if you were using SSO or not, and we saw that it could only be accessed by one password, so if it wasn't obvious from the name, we knew it was uh, being used by one password for biometric unlock. Now, Along with um, the item in the keychain, there were these comments that were added, which tell us that it's, the item here is encrypted by the secure enclave. And this tracked because when we looked at what was stored in the item, it was just a bunch of random ciphertext that we couldn't do anything with. So we were wondering where the secure enclave key entry is because we couldn't see it in the keychain access application. We couldn't query it with the security CLI tool, which is the built-in uh, macOS CLI tool for interacting with the keychain. Uh, so we wanted to understand where it was, what was going on and how it was being used. What we did for this was hooked the sec item copy matching uh, method with Frida and logged the parameters passed to it and the return values from it. This method is used to query the keychain. And so we wanted to trigger the fingerprint unlock and see what was uh, being accessed from the keychain by 1Password when going through that flow. And amongst other things, one of the things we saw accessed was a sec key ref or a secret key reference. And um, that's what was returned. And in the query was an A tag or an application tag uh, with those hex bytes you see in the top red box. And if you decode those, you get the string of com agile bits one password memory enclave key. So this seemed likely what we were uh, looking for based on the name, but we wanted to be sure. So, uh, we wanted to see if it was being used to decrypt anything or decrypt that biometric unlock entry. 
Um, now, secure enclave keys, it's not the case that you just access them and then do what you wish with the bytes. Instead, you ask the secure enclave to encrypt something, decrypt something, or sign something. In this case, it, we thought it would be decrypting something. So we did the same thing with hooking sec key create decrypted data, which is how you would ask the secure enclave to decrypt something. And we log the parameters and the return value. And we do see that that's during the biometric unlock, that sec key ref is being used. It's decrypting the ciphertext that was stored in the biometric unlock entry. And in return, we get 32 bytes. Uh, so we thought 32 bytes, that's great. That sounds like an AES key. Maybe that's the muck. But it turned out it was not the muck. And we didn't really know what to do. So we just took these 32 bytes and started trial and error trying to decrypt things. And um, finally, we found an item in the encrypted SQLite database called Ank Unlock Key. And we were able to successfully decrypt it with AES. And uh, in return, we got the muck. So now we fully understood the chain here of the memory enclave key in the secure enclave being used to decrypt the biometric unlock entry in the keychain. From there, you have a key that can be used to decrypt this entry in the SQLite database. Then you have the muck, which can decrypt the rest. Um, so now we fully understand this process, but obviously we can't just access the keychain um, on behalf of 1Password unless we have a way to inject our own code into 1Password and query the keychain, because those items can only be queried by 1Password. So now we're going to talk about how we accomplished getting that code injection. Yeah, so we needed to uh, have the 1Password bundle ID and we needed to not invalidate the code signature. And uh, there's a relatively old technique on Electron where you can inject, uh, essentially the main.js file isn't included in the signature check and so you can just overwrite it. And to protect against that, they added this enable embedded ASAR integrity validation fuse and this was enabled in the modern version of 1Password. Uh, but we implied the same thinking that we did to the hardened runtime and went through all of our scraped old versions and we found one that was created either before or around the time when this flag was introduced and it had it disabled. Even if we couldn't find that though, there was this additional GitHub security advisory that was a bypass to this fuse. And, uh, you know, if we couldn't find either of those, we probably would have gone and hunted for some similar bug ourselves. So we can overwrite the main.js file, but that isn't good enough to do what we need to do. Uh, essentially, there are no functions in Node.js that we can call directly that will let us read the keychain and use the secure enclave. And so we need to call these native functions from native code. And because of the hardened runtime, which is applied to this version of 1Password, we can't actually do the typical thing where you'd write your own library and have the Node.js code hand off to it. And so we took a step back and saw that in the entitlements, uh, there was this Apple security allow JIT entitlement, which essentially means that somewhere in the process it would be okay to have a read write execute page of memory. Once we saw that, we realized a browser exploit would probably work, and so we found an applicable CVE that was exploited in the wild. We did the standard browser exploit things and got our JavaScript heap and read write primitives and used that to run shellcode by corrupting a WASM object. I'll show you a video of that in a second. But I also wanted to call out that because we're not in a renderer process, we can kind of cheat a little bit with ASLR by just running VM map outside of the process and then directly writing all the addresses we need to a file and then reading that file into our exploit. All right, so hopefully you see that, it's on the monitor. Yeah, so in this video, we're just adding a demo password that we're going to extract. Uh, we're adding it right now, then we'll show you that SIP is enabled. And then what we're going to do is run a make file. And that make file is going to compile a C program that prints out some function addresses in the core foundation library. The reason this is important is because we need those functions, uh, but we didn't want to do the work of adjusting the ASLR ourselves. And these functions are in the shared cache, so we can just print them out, and the addresses are the same between processes. That print is going to be used to generate our final ASLR adjusted uh, shellcode in JavaScript. And we're going to start the old version of 1Password. The reason we do that is because on the first run, a deep signature check is going to be performed. Uh, but we can just start it, kill it, and then run it again with our modified main.js. And because this fuse is disabled and only a shallow check runs, we can run our browser exploit. Yeah, and so there it is. We'll show you that the password matches.
think it's up. <laughs> no, I'm not good. Oh man, this is the hardest part of the talk. Go back to where you were, that right slide. There we are. Okay, so this is the di oh man. <laughs> So this is the diagram of what we essentially did uh, and I think it's important to call out here that although obviously one password could have used that enforcement flag uh, but for everything else in order to get that native code execution and actually exploit it we essentially just waited and you know we scraped the old versions but the vulnerabilities were in Electron and, and Chromium and it can be really hard to secure that when you're releasing new versions uh, every day. And so here's a vulnerability summary of what we reported. Uh, this is a little bit uh, there are a few more vulnerabilities here than what's going to be on the next slide. The reason that is is because the initial XPC entry vulnerability is really what needed to be fixed, not the other stuff that we talked about with the session writing. And we also reported the uh, Chrome managed policy bypasses to them, or to Google rather. And so here's an exploitability summary. Uh, I think it's important to call out that SIP doesn't prevent this and root is not required. Low privilege malware can perform these attacks. Uh, but uh, the main issues that 1Password was able to fix are, are highlighted in green. And so the XPC bypass was fixed, the biometric enforcement flag was fixed, and most importantly, the settings modification is now being enforced. And you might say, well, why is that important? It's important because the first two currently exploitable issues are not exploitable if you just disable that setting. And so while it might degrade the user experience a little bit, you are fully protected with the newest version of 8.10.38 which was released in August. Uh, now the, the browser extension injection and impersonation like I mentioned earlier that's not really a, a bug per se it's kind of just how browsers work and the browser support get PBID bypass is a little bit interesting because there's not really a clear line of ownership to the issue. Uh, so one password can't really securely look up the code signing information of their parent process. It is true that all browsers could maybe switch to XPC to provide that audit token. Uh, it's one available method to perform interprocess communication with uh, or on Mac OS rather. But it's also true that Apple might be able to provide some way to look up your parent process's code signing information securely. It's just not super clear who, uh, who needs to go and fix this. And so because you can't really fix those things, we're going to talk about how to detect them. So I pulled all of these bundle IDs from the browser support process. These are all the Chromium based browsers that it will accept as a parent process. And these are the non Chromium based browsers that it will accept as a parent process. And so for the uh, extension, injection and impersonation, those are relatively straightforward to fix. Essentially what you have to do is go enumerate the dangerous flags, which I've done for you. They're highlighted in orange and you just need to alert anytime those flags are used. Uh, we also out of an abundance of caution are just blocking the developer builds of certain browsers because they have a slightly different threat model. And for the browser support issue, again, if you just disable that setting, uh, you will be fine. Uh, I can tell you personally I'm not going to disable the setting, I like using the browser extension and I think having malware on your computer is already a pretty significant bar. Now uh, if you don't want to disable the extension like me, here's a you can alert on it. Uh, basically during normal use when you click a browser icon, what's going to happen is LaunchD actually spawns that process. And so if you just set an alert for any time a browser uh, is spawned and the parent is not LaunchD, it's likely malicious or it's going to be some kind of headless browsing and you can usually limit that to the people that need to do that at your company. Probably QA teams. And a malicious actor might look at that alert and, and try to get around it, right, by getting launch D to spawn their parent, uh, to spawn their exploit process and then execing in directly. And so what you can look for there is the exec. Uh, the, the point of looking for the exec is that there are a couple different ways to obscure or, or you know move around those read write pipes. You don't have to use the process tree that we showed you here, but at every um, for every actual exploit, at some point they're going to have to exec into a trusted browser, and so that's what you would, uh, would alert on. And it looks like PID reuse in LaunchD child processes. So here's our full disclosure timeline. We reported all the stuff that we found initially in January of 2024. And then we followed up on March 8th and reported, reported that the biometrics flag was missing. And we actually weren't 
convinced at the time that it was going to be exploitable in practice and so we put together a proof of concept and gave it to them on March 22nd and that confirmed for both us and 1Password that this was going to work. Here's a remediation timeline. Again the, the browser support fix is unclear but you can toggle that setting. The XPC bypass was fixed in April. Uh, the settings file modifications, this says it was scheduled to be fixed in August. That version is out now. We just submitted the slides before. And the biometrics flag issue was fixed in 8.10.36. And they followed up in 8.10.38 with just a reliability change. It was actually fixed in 3.6, but I would just recommend upgrading to the, to the latest version. So here is where you can find the code we've released at uh, Morgan C3 slash one password exploits. Um, as of now, we released uh, the free scripts we used while doing some of this research. Um, none of it is really specific to one password at all. Um, it could definitely be extended and useful for researching other applications. In terms of exploits, the only thing we've released is a proof of concept for the XPC validation bypass issue. It's not going to decrypt your vaults, but rather just demonstrate the issue. Uh, in the future, we uh, will add more code here once ample time has been given for people to be upgrading their 1Password to safe versions and for the other issues to be fixed. Um, and yeah, we may have some time for a few questions if people had them. Sorry, what was that? Uh, yeah, we, we took a look at them. Um, I would just say any. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Any other password managers? Yes. It was just us over the course of about a month. And the, the guy to your left helped us a bit with the last coolest vulnerability right That's there. True. I'm, I'm so sorry, can you say that again? Oh, just we wanted to know how safe our passwords were. You know, really the detections, I would say, are the most important part for us. And I would say, Practically, we expected this is we expected this is likely possible with you know most major password managers or similar attacks. We wanted to do it on one password because we use one password and we wanted to use it on red team operations. Um, and then of course get the issues fixed as well. So uh, we we took a brief look at other password managers, but. This was a significant amount of effort for us, and so you can imagine that we wouldn't want to do the work, uh, especially on you know work time, if uh, if it wasn't going to pay out on a red team. All right, thank you.